So um, the definition of a group in general, so it is uh, you know, people that are gathered, three or more people, I don't know, but certainly just having people together, they can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. And when you remember those terms, always think about you know, our sexual orientation. Okay, the, so the sexual orientation is the um, homo, that means the group is alike, hetero is the group is different. And yes, this is an NCE book. I'm using that to teach from today because this is a pretty good I, a group. The NCEs are the counselors, so the LPCs. Um, so I switch. I, I teach several mental health exams. I mean, so several mental health licensure. Um, the information is all the same. Okay, so whether you've learned it from this book or a different book, it's all the same. I just like to make sure that you get a different view sometimes. Okay, groups are groups are groups, no matter where you do them. Some of the advantages of group, of course, so that people learn in social context. Um, you get to experience social support. Um, sometimes you get peer confrontation, which is okay. Uh, groups, group norms develop, and it's a safe place to practice new skills. So I'm pretty sure most of you had that groups class way back in the day when you were in school. Um, as an instructor, I love my groups class. Um, this is the first time we're teaching it online. So we're doing it in a, uh, like a, a, a Skype platform. So it's a little different, but I, I do think that this is probably the way of the future. A lot of my students have told me during COVID time, their NA and their AA groups were actually online. So I do think this is kind of where we're going. So learning to do this on group is just is important as well. Okay, so the groups, the goals of counseling, of course, is to learn to trust yourself and others, self-knowledge, increase self-direction, you learn more effective social skills. So in general, remember, a group is a group that's the same as your patient. So what is said in group stays in group because that's my patient. Can I guarantee that that'll stay in, in, that will stay confidential? No, cannot, right? No guarantees there. I will ask the group. I'll remind them that we agreed to this, but there's no, there's no plan that I can make everybody you want to do, kick you out of group. And especially if it's a court mandated group, that's just not going to happen. Okay. All of your groups are on Zoom and the social worker board approves them. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and Medicaid, I'm pretty sure now also approves those as well. Okay. So just some kind of different type of group. So psychotherapy. So those are usually different than counseling groups. Psychotherapy is going to be a group that actually does therapy. Those are the kind that you're going to see many times in hospitals. You're going to see um, people who have... Um, um, you know, mental health issues. NAMI, N-A-M-I, the National Association of, what does that stand for? NAMI is a worldwide organization, so you might have one in your area, okay? So NAMI runs groups, uh, and one of the cool things about NAMI is they actually run a group for people with mental illnesses as well as their support group, and they run it at the same time. So one in, in one room are the people who have the mental health issues, and in the other group are the caregivers for people who do. Okay, so there are lots of ways to make sure that we share information. And one of the... Um, uh, well, okay, I'm sorry you don't have sound, Rochelle. Um, remind me to send you the video or log back in later. I do apologize. Okay, so psychotherapy, again, you're going to see there are therapeutic, psychoeducational, I'm learning something, right? My psychoeducational group is I am teaching the clients. So not only is it, um, you know, uh, educational, but it's educational from a mental health viewpoint, a social work viewpoint. So I could be teaching parenting skills. I could be teaching um, anger management, social skills, any of those things I could be teaching in that group. Okay, structured groups, sometimes my st structured groups are going to be those task centered. They're short, get your task, get it done. Okay, so those are my uh, learning job skills, um, the DUI class, right? Short, sweet, learn what you need to learn and get it over with. So those are my, uh, those are my structured groups. Okay, self-help groups, AA, NA. Remember, the self-help groups are not ran by a professional. They are ran by people who run, who are members of the group. Okay. My the, a question on the test many times is a client says that they are um, an atheist or agnostic or, or they don't believe in God. Where should you send them? AA does not does not tout 
God as I know him or Jesus Christ or any of those things. AA says it is God as you see him. So if God is a tree or a house or whatever you want it to be, that is the God. So in that question, um, we're not going to send him away. We're going to remind him that that is what AA does. Okay. It's as you see God. Now in my area, I live in the good old South. Um, your higher power. You got it. I live in the good old South. So our AA meetings are in our infrastructure and they have to be churches. Okay. So, but that does not mean that they're faith based. Now celebrate recovery really is a faith based group. Um, they started, they were started with um, uh, Rick. What's his name? Did the an Outback um, Saddleback church that Rick. Okay. So those are my Celebrate Recovery groups. They are based on scripture, okay? And they are they are groups that are um, out back. I'm sorry, they are Celebrate Recovery. Thank you, Rick Warren. Thank you. So those are really based on um, uh, scripture. They're based on scripture. In order to do a Celebrate Recovery, a church has to go all the way out and they have to be trained and to, and to work through. Um, Celebrate Recovery also talks about hurts, hangups, and habits, not just about your addictions of alcohol and drugs. Okay? So we're talking about those, those self-support groups. Those are always going to be um, mutual health. That's what that means, or self-help groups. Okay? Um, T groups are training groups and task groups. I bet everybody in this group has been assigned a task group. You tell your boss, your principal, your somebody, you know, I think we should do this. And they say, well, go ahead. Why don't you start a committee? Okay, <laughs> that's a task group. <laughs> You've been appointed to be on this task group, right? So if you get that question and you're on a task group or any other kind of group, the first thing you're going to do is find out the meaning of the group. Like, what are we doing here? What's our goal? So a first question, remember, is always, always try to gather as much information as I can. The process of group, the healing happens in the dynamics. The content is what I bring. The content is what we're studying. But the healing happens in the actual dynamics of the group. So when you're looking at those group questions, we're going to look at what stage of the group um, that the client is in. That's how we really know kind of where we're at. Okay. So dynamics, again, those are the forces interplay between the group members. Okay. Group cohesion, that is when the, when the group is cohesive and that's when they share. That's when they trust someone. That's when they trust someone to say, oh, by the way, I did this, I did that. The group of goal is to make best friends with somebody and be best friends forever, right? No, if you see that question on the test, that is not the group. That is not the role of group. Okay, it's not to hook you up. It's not for you to be friends. It is not. It is to help you work through whatever issues you're going through. And the assumption is like everything else. Once the group terminates, you'll be done. Okay. Again, cohesiveness and cohesiveness happens at very different state rate uh, at different rates. Some groups get cohesive very quickly. My more heterogeneous, the groups that are more different, sometimes that takes a little bit longer for us to get cohesive. Okay, you'll see some of these sometimes the role of group members in the group. Okay, so roles aren't assigned; they are roles that people assume during that group process. Okay, so then if a, uh, Facilitative or building role, that's the person who um, the many, which may help people, group members feel a part of the group. So sometimes when you've gone to a new group, someone's going to be there to, to welcome you. Come on in. We're so glad you're here. That's the role someone plays. The maintenance role. The biggest one you'll see many times is the blocker. The blocker is the one who is happy where a group is at and they don't want to change. So many times they're the person who's not quite re ready to share yet. And they're like, oh, no, 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 not sharing. And don't you share either. So not only are they blocking um, what they want to say, they're going to block any other group member, especially as cohesiveness happens. The closer we get, that blocker is going to say, wait, no, no, no. Okay. I've got those lovely styles of leadership. By the way, those are the same leadership styles that you'll see in an agency. Okay, so that autocratic, I'm in charge, which is the same as that authoritarian, you know, many times we sit in a parenting role. Democratic, 
We're not talking a Republican or Democratic Party. We're talking about, hey, we all got to vote, right? So that means the leader is not, not necessarily um, making sure everyone does the same thing. It's making sure everybody has input or laissez-faire. Um, and anybody else from Louisiana want to pronounce that differently? Because that's my best, you know, <laughs> laissez-faire. <laughs> but um, that really means fairly lazy. So whether it's in an agency or whether a group, that leadership style is someone who kind of just sits back and lets it happen. Um, not always a bad thing. If I have a group that is uh, capable of running by themselves and, and they're doing what they need to do and all I need to do is kind of occasionally step in to facilitate, that laissez-faire style is fine. Um, again, that term is the same term that you use in administration and supervision as well. Okay. So as we get down to kind of these active listening skills, these are the same active listening skills that we use with our individual. So you've probably seen these someplace else. Same skills, right? So active listening includes all of these. Reflecting. So remember, reflecting is reflecting back with a feeling. I'm giving you the feeling that you didn't say. OK, so the client comes in and he talks about, wow, it's, it's, it's tough raising these kids. and I can't believe I have to do this every single day. Um, and I say, wow, I know it sounds like you're having a really hard time. This must be difficult for you. I'm reflecting back the words he didn't say. Um, and I had a question today with somebody. So if I reflect back and my client and I'm wrong, what will happen? If I say, oh, wow, it sounds like you were having a really bad day and that's not true, what will happen? Anybody? Ah, no, I won't necessarily lose trust, but he'll tell me. He'll say, uh, no, if I'm way off base, he'll say no. If I'm on base, then that's going to open up the door for that improved communication, right? Because the assumption is many times our clients don't have the words, they don't have the language, the verbiage to talk about feelings, and sometimes they don't know the feelings. Sometimes, and you, we all know that. Sometimes those, those feelings, those words just come out as anger, and they're not always anger. Okay? Uh, clarifying, if you've had me before, clarifying is when my 16 year old talks to me and she uses words that I don't know what they mean. It's okay to clarify in the middle of a conversation, right? So she'll be talking to me and she'll say something and I'm like, what? So <laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I'll remind you, <laughs> if you don't have a 16-year-old, you can always use the Urban Dictionary. It changes often. Just mute yourself. There we go. Okay. Everybody use the Urban Dictionary? There's some things in here that you probably don't even want to know. Okay. <laughs> if you're ever working with kids, <laughs> you need to visit this often. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm like, that means what? <laughs> okay. So honestly, if you're working with middle, high, even elementary school kids and they use terminology that you don't know and it changes daily. My 23 year old now, she'll tell my 16 year old, she's like, what? What does that mean? Macaroni in a pot. Should I Google that or do I want to know? Should I put that in? Will it scare me? <laughs> okay, let's see here. I, don't, I probably don't want to know. <laughs> I know what WAP is. <laughs> My daughter showed me the video. <laughs> is that, let's see, does it come up? Cardi B, yes. So what's macaroni in a pot? It didn't come in my open dictionary. Should I Google it regular? I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. Uh, it's a song. Okay, I'll have to ask my kid. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but anyway, I strongly recommend um, to keep up with the times, and especially if you're working with teenagers, we all know that we need to speak the lingo, right? But if not, I clarify. I'll just say, I'm sorry. What does that mean? Explain to me. Um, I'll say, I'm old. What does that mean? Okay. So summarizing is at the end, right? At the end of the conversation, at the end of anything, I'm going to summarize. Okay. 
summarize also think of summative that's the end of a program right we're doing program evaluation my summative is the evaluation at the end of the program the one in the middle is called my formative so i'm forming summative summarizing is what i'm going to do at the end of the counseling session or even at the end of the the last group session i'm going to summarize facilitating um, so i am that is what most often the leader does uh, the goal is not to lead the group the goal is i'm going to start off in those very early stages where we're doing some when we're beginning to like um, form then at that point i have to be the leader i have to kind of you know keep control of the group but as the group processes and cohesiveness happens my goal is that i'm not going to be um, facilitating the whole time empathizing remember we do not sympathize it's not that we're not bad people, but people who do lots of other things, their friends, their buddies, their pals, they sympathize. We empathize. Okay, so if you ever see on the test about empathy, a sympathy, we don't do that. And I am sorry things happen, but they're not going to pay me because I, I can show them sympathy. They can get that from their grandmother and their cousin and everybody else. Um, a, a good example I always use is um, if you ever work with drug dealers or drug users, you know that... Um, you know, some horrible stories, some, and you, people in general, some horrible stories. So when a mother tells you that she left her kids in the car, hot car and they died while she was able, while she was going to get, no, get high, I can empathize. I can, I can put myself in her shoes when that happened. Does it make it okay? It does not. But I can empathize with her. I can understand that as an addict, getting your next high is the most important thing. And it wasn't that she didn't care about her kids, but she's an addict. That's empathy. That's what we bring to the table that people outside um, a mental health profession don't bring to the table. Okay, so we don't sympathize, we empathize. Interpreting, of course, uh, many times that's making sure um, uh, my words are understood, trying not to use those big social work words. Confronting, confronting most often is the one we use when it's a drug user or a pedophile. On the test, it's okay to confront. If, if, if I see a question where I'm confronting, it's one of my options. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look down to see if there's any other options. If there's no other options, then I'm probably going to go back and see if it's a drug question, right? Because in those drug groups and with my pedophiles, if you are speaking, many times they are lying. And that's because they're in denial. Different story. Supporting, um, supporting the group members, blocking, of course, that's making sure other group members sometimes allow the group to process to happen for everybody. I'm always assessing, I'm modeling. So my clients, my, the group members are watching me, okay, and then suggesting. So those are the member, the leadership of group. However, these active listening skills, you'll see many other places on the test, okay? Initiating, evaluating, and of course, terminating, okay? So again, group leaders, you should know theories of group counseling. You should understand the principles of group dynamics. Look at the ethical issues and linking. Linking in a group is when I've got Bobby over there who tells me he's getting a divorce and I say, oh my gosh, Mary Sue, didn't you get a divorce like a few years ago? What do you think? So I'm linking two group members that have the same thing. Now linking in the real world, right? Getting kicked out. My group's not holding that many. I have to do a new group. Wow. Sorry. Okay. So linking in the real world uh, outside of the group process is really about making sure that you, um, you, that's my broker, right? I'm linking sources to other sources. That's what linking looks like outside the group. That's brokering. Universality, of course, we like that inside group. It makes us feel that other people aren't, are um, going through the same things we're going through. Um, scapegoating, we can see that both in family therapy and in group therapy. That's my scapegoating. Co-leaders, if you choose to have a co-leader, if the question is about co-leaders, we have to be on the same orientation, right? If I'm coming from a, a, a psychodynamic viewpoint and someone, this person behind, beside me is coming from a behavior viewpoint, that's not going to work. Hetero versus homo, remember? Hetero, people are of the of different, homo is the same. So groups that are homogeneous, unfortunately, do work better. Okay. My open versus closed group. When a closed group is, a clo so for example, AA. 
And AA, some of them are open groups and some of them are closed groups. If your professor made you go to a group when John, you were in school. I can't help you right now. Ah, thank you for sharing. Okay. So um, when we, um, uh, if you have to go to a group, I make my students go to a group every, every semester. It's part of my group class. Um, what I suggest they do is make sure they look for an open group. An open group, especially my NA or AA groups, means that it's available to anybody. A closed group says that you, it's not available to anybody. So sometimes in AA, you know, the, the principle of AA, NA, any of those groups is you only have to have the desire to stop drinking, right? So um, if the person beside me is, comes in reeking of alcohol and I'm struggling to be clean, I might want to be in a closed group. A closed group is one that would work through the 12 steps. It doesn't mean that the person beside me wouldn't be using. It doesn't mean that. It just means that all of us would be in the same group at the same time. We're going to have a bit much better, tighter relationship, right? In an open group, anybody can come anytime. But a closed group, until those 12 weeks are up or 15 weeks are up or whatever we're doing, uh, no one else gets in. When a closed group is closed and members drop off, we do not allow other people's pe people in. Okay? Oh, excuse me. Okay. Groups should be at least 90 minutes for adults, 20 to 30 minutes for children. Okay. I just want to talk about some of the stages really quick, and then we're going to go for um, questions. So in general, it depends on where you went to school and what you learned. Um, I learned the uh, Tuckman, the norming, storming, forming model. That's what I live by. Um, but it doesn't matter whether you use the, learn the Boston model, the Corey model. They all follow the same steps. Okay. And I really only suggest that you learn one because if you learn one, you can figure out the rest of them. Okay, so they're, they're, they're going to have different words, but it's still going to be the same steps. So Tuckman taught us forming, storming, norming, performing, and mourning. Those are the stages of group according to Tuckman. Those are the ones that I, I was taught back in social work school five million years ago, and those are the ones that I teach now. What I do find, though, is some of my, um, my schools, uh, y'all up there in the north, <laughs> teach the Boston model, um, which is Yalem. And we'll go over that in just a minute. But it really doesn't matter. The words are still the same. So forming, the group is getting together. Storming, whenever the group gets together, I call it jockeying for positions. People are like, I want to sit there. You always make the coffee. Oh, my gosh, she never comes in. Ah! So that happens a couple of weeks. People are really, really just fighting. If you see a question that says, you know, they're challenging the group leader, they are um, um, fighting with each other, uh, a young uh, social worker calls and says, I don't know what to do because my group keeps fighting. They're in the storming stage. And according to Tuckman, you have to have that stage to get through that. So once you storm, then you norm. Again, the group sets the norms. They perform, that's when the, the, the dynamics, that's when the healing, the cohesion is happening, and then group ends, okay? So um, in the forming stages and the storming stages, that is when the social worker is working really, really hard, okay? She's trying to set the, get the people to sit down and people show up on time and people to not be rude to each other. But by the time you're in the norming stage, the group is running it. The group's going to say, oh, shut up, Bobby, you talk so much. Or Mary Sue, give somebody else a chance to talk. Because at this point, they know each other. They've developed that cohesion. They've been, they feel like they can share. So that's the goal is to kind of get to that point of the group. Okay. And by the way, that can change. You can be a well-performing group and something happen and you go back to where you were. Okay. So just because you were there doesn't mean you'll always be there. Now, if we look at then, um, so these are Corey's models. Okay, so Yalem's were orientation, conflict, cohesion, and, and termination. So, of course, orientation would be the same as norming. Conflict is my storming stage. I'm sorry, orientation is forming. Conflict is my storming stage. Cohesion, okay, that is my performing stage, and then end. So it doesn't matter which one you know. It, it certainly doesn't matter. It just matters that you know the process. Okay, 
So then Corey used pre-group. Corey believed that you had to have a pre-group, which sounds good and all, but we both know that that's not an option. But if a test asks, you know, if there's a pre-group, then yes, there are many times it's a screening of who we decide, who we, who decides who comes in. Okay. So then transition, of course, so if I'm using these pre-group, my, in, my initial session is going to be then my, right, that's my forming. And then we're going to transition. That's my storming, okay? Working is my performing. And then the end, which is my morning. So it, again, it doesn't matter. Um, these are Yalom's. Yalom has the 11 curative factors. Okay, And this is an APGAR. I'll gladly send you this as well, but this is an APGAR, okay? Altruism. Altruism really means I'm I'm doing what is well, the best thing for, for for I'm giving to society. I'm giving back to the group without wanting anything for me. So I always think of like Bill and Melinda Gates when people think of altruism. You know, you're just going to give. You're going to give to the group. You're going to give to whatever organization and has nothing in it for you. Universality, of course, is know that you're not the only one in the group. So interpersonal learning, remember, that's one of those prefixes you need to know also. Inter means outside of me and more than one person. Intercourse is not just with me, right? Inter, I-N-T-E-R. I-N-T-R-A is inside of me. Intra-psychic, intra-learning, I-N-T-R-A, inside of me, I-N-T-E-R, outside of me, with other members, other people, someone else. So that's just a, an important, um, you know, those prefixes will help you through the test. Okay, social uh, imparting information, socialization skills, imitative behavior, group cohesion, and that word catharsis is. Anybody know what that means? Catharsis is, is that emotional it's, spew. It's, go ahead, go ahead. A re release of emotion, like you're yes. going to release of feelings and emotions you got it you got it that's the ah or, the, ah or whatever it is it's an emotional release sometimes it can just be crying right good job thank you okay corrective recapitulation of for primary family group all that means is that in the group process, sometimes there's someone in the group that's that I've got some, you know, transference with. Maybe they're bringing up some feelings. They remind me sometimes of a mother or a grandmother or somebody. And that's a way to work through those issues by working through the, the, that with a group member. OK, insulation of hope there. It's going to get better. Right. Existentialism, existential factors. Again, I'm not alone. Um, and. Um, uh, participant growth and development could occur if it's one of those types of groups. Okay, my big three guys, of course, are going to be my Corey, my um, Corey, Yalom, and Tuckman. Um, I've seen Jacob Moreno sometimes. He is he invented psychodrama, so if you ever see that, that's who that belonged to. So that belongs to. I think that's about it. Ah. We know these terms, right? Primary, secondary, and tertiary. We know those in individual. We do know those in the group session as well? Well, of course we do. So remember, those are public health terms, okay? So I always use the COVID as the example. So what is the primary prevention of COVID? A primary prevention is always making sure that um, I, I prevent it for everybody that I can. I'm trying to stop it. Um, mass before people get it. So every commercial you see, everything says wear your mask, social distance, all of those things are my primary prevention strategies for COVID. So the same way in a group, if I'm having a group that's a primary group, the goal of that primary group really is just to then, you know, keep girls from getting pregnant, keep kids from using drugs, any, whatever the goal is, it's primary. My secondary one is then, of course, the incident has already happened or they've been exposed. If you've been exposed to COVID, um, you know that uh, there are some, some things you have to do, right? You got to wait 14 days, um, self-isolate, all of those things, okay? And then let's see here. Tertiary, that's if I have the full-blown illness, right? So at that point, then I am, I'm, I'm uh, trying to stay healthy, trying to stay alive, and not trying to spread the disease. So primary, secondary, and tertiary groups that we use individually, and you might see in group as well. Okay. 
think that's it on those. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to throw in some group questions over here. Um, any questions, guys? Any questions? We're going to put that information to questions. Um, so most often you'll see a question, um, and if you haven't seen it in practice, and I'm not sure if it's on this test or not, um, but we're looking at someone comes to group um, and they share with the group um, in the group session that they, um, they killed their wife a year ago, and they share it in group. What is the first thing you would do? Run out and call 911, stop the group process, right? Anybody? What are you going to do? Mm, it's so quiet. Okay, so uh, what can I share? Of course, what I can share. Yes, if anyone is in imminent danger of hurting themselves or someone else, okay? If he tells me that he killed his wife uh, two years ago and he shares it with the group, there's a lot, a lot I can do. If it's the first question and the question talks about they're full of feelings or full of emotions, then I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to address the emotions, right? Um, I, I cannot guarantee group um, uh, confidentiality. I cannot guarantee that. So the, what we're going to do is process what happened in group because if, a, if we're there, of course, he felt comfortable enough and enough group cohesion to share that. So we're just going to process it and kind of see, okay, so now what? Okay. So in general, a first question is a first question, whether it's in group or anything else. Not a fan of the acronyms. You know that. Um, and maybe it's just because I can't keep them in my head. I won't pretend. I've got enough in my head that's kind of scary. However, you know, I do follow the social work model, the one that we have been used. And I'm sorry, my desktop might freak you out if you're OCD. That'd be OCD or OCD personality disorder. Remember, those are different. If they killed her yesterday, Rhonda, it would still wouldn't matter as long as I think that they're safe. As long as I don't think they're in imminent danger. He can come in my office with bloody clothes and a knife in his hand. And if I don't think anyone is in imminent danger, there's not a thing I can do. My code of ethics says I'm going to protect my, I'm going to, I need to protect my client or someone else. Um, it, um, those are the only things I can share. Of course, that goes, pedophile doesn't count. So if a kid who's under 18 tells me that his father, mother, sister, someone abused him, then that I'm going to report, of course, right? Okay. But yeah, I cannot. And if it goes to court, I'm still going to follow my same code of ethics and say up and down, Your Honor, I don't want to share this information. This is privileged information. When my client told me this, he had no reason to think that I was going to share this. So I'm going to still take that. that this is this is privileged. I, I don't want to share. Okay. Um, remember, my values have no place in the code of ethics. Okay. So if I'm if I if my values are getting in the way of the code of ethics. If anything is getting a, anything that any feeling that's getting in the way between me and my client, that's a supervisory issue, right? Okay, that's the one time I can go for supervision, um, whether or not self so supervision. If I'm in an agency or consultation, if I'm in private practice, but if there's some emotions coming up, I can't. Can you believe he told me that? I'm like in the corner bawling. Oh my gosh, I can't believe what this. That's what your supervisor is for. That's what a consultant is for. Because your values have no place in the code of ethics. Okay? We're human. We're human. Of course that's going to have some effect on us. Okay? But my client comes first. I don't get to transfer him. Remember, unless I've seen him naked. That's the rule. And I'm pretty sure I hadn't seen him naked. So, <laughs> in general, though, I don't get to transfer. I am the very best social worker ever. And, and I don't say that. Uh, I say it for the test, but I also say it in general. The people that I work with, I, I work with the best and the brightest. I work with people with these amazing ideas. You guys are so amazing. I hear stories and things that you do. Um, you're, you're the top, right? So that little piece of paper is the only thing that makes it official, but you're amazing. You know what to do. So on the test, we're not referring out. We're, we're only seeking supervision if it affects the client. Other than that, we got this. Okay, so 
Remind you, remind you, remind you of how we answer, especially the vignettes. Safety first, safety first. My safety, your safety, my client's safety. Okay? Then if it's high in emotion, if they are crying, if they are mad, if they're cussing me out, as long as the question says, I, I, I mean, I feel safe, I'm, I, he, he's, he's cussing me out, but I feel safe, then I'm still just going to address those feelings, right? That's what I'm there for. He's mad because I was late. He's mad because he has to be in court. He was court ordered and he doesn't want to be here. You know, I don't get to give it back to him. I'm sorry. I don't get to transfer him. I got to just figure it out. Then I assess. Assess, 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 assess. Assess does not mean just pull out that little assessment book. It means gather as much information as you can. Anything else, you get paid to be nosy. Ask, ask, ask. That's what we do, okay? So it may not seem, and I always say ask, it may say recommend a psychological evaluation. That is still an assessment because I don't know what the problem is. So if I'm sending them out for a psychological, that means I think there's some cognitive processing, some cognitive difficulties going on. If it's sending them out to a psychiatrist, that means I think that he needs some medication. He Maybe he's suicidal. Okay, but those are still assess questions because I can't determine what to do until I rule out those type of things. You know that we always assess if it's medical, we're going to send them to a doctor, right? I missed that day in MD school where I could diagnose someone with a, you know, ICD, ICD-10 code. But to me, that's still just referring him out because he'll go to the doctor, he'll get cleared and then he'll come back to me. So all of those things are just gathering as much information. The other piece I'll tell you, and as always, prove it in the question. Tell me what words you see in the question that you know that's the answer. That keeps us from going outside of that box. Okay? So the more experience we have, the more we'll see a question, but like, that's not what we do at work. The question didn't ask you what you do at work, right? It only asks you what happens in these four little lines. Um, and if you've been with me for a half a minute, you know, uh, when you assume, that is not what you need to do, right? <laughs> no assuming. We're going to prove it in the question. Um, if, if there's not enough in the answer to prove it in the vignette, okay? If there's not enough, then I have two left. I have to go back and compare the two, okay? So let's be brave. Number one, please either type in your answers or you can actually speak it out loud. And I'm still going to ask how you know. Okay. So a social worker is assigned to work with a group of teenage mothers who meet regularly at a neighborhood health center for health information and mutual support. Members do not attend regularly and the group is drifting apart. Though some members are committed to counseling, what should be done first to encourage greater involvement? That's the first question, okay? And I'll remind you of the concept of group think. Group think, if you haven't um, heard it before, it'll be on the test many times. Group think is the process where we just go with what everybody else says because we don't want to rock the boat. So you're in the meeting and the boss says, wow, I think tomorrow everybody should just come in in their underwear, right? So mm -hmm. it reminds you of that to say, yeah, okay, we've all done it. We've all gone to lunch with people that we didn't want to go to lunch with or a place we didn't want to go, right? That's group think, okay? So as you're answering your questions, don't be guilty of group think because she said one, she said it's got to be the answer. No, she knows as much as you know or he knows as much as you know, okay? That's my group think. The goal of group think is to avoid dissonance or we, we want to be liked by our friends. Let's go back to that question. Okay, so I'm at number one. Oops, sorry. Try to share my screen over here. Put that one back. All my screens closed. Okay, number one. What should I do first? I got three ones. 
initiate discussion with members focusing on their concerns about the group and their involvement in planning the structure of meetings to be discussed. Uh, and how can I support that in the question? What words in the question would I see to support that? Well, I know it's the first question, right? So my first question says, ding, 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 gather more information. Because some of them are committed. Ah, let's see here. So then, initiate a discussion with members focusing on their concerns about the group and involve them in planning the structure of meetings and topics to be discussed. Okay, so then, the, a social worker is assigned to work with a group of teenage mothers who meet regularly at a neighborhood health center for information and mutual support. Members do not attend regularly and the group is drifting apart, although some members are coming. Okay, so then that's my key right there. And someone said it already. So some members are coming and some aren't coming. I want to know why they're not coming, right? Hey, what's wrong with me that you don't want to come back to my group? Okay, that's my one. I'm going to gather as much information as I can. Okay, provide concrete incentives. Do I know if that's the reason they're not coming? I don't know that, okay? Um, combine well baby visits with meetings so the mothers will find it more convenient. I don't know that either. Those are all at the intervention level. I don't know. Let me just ask what the problem is. Perfect, okay? I learned that in school, that's the forming stage, clinicians. I missed that, Kara, what's that? Hold on, let me go back. That forming stage clinicians should establish rules for the group. So we're, we're trying to establish the basic rules for the group, and you're right. But in general, when it comes to the norming stage, the group sets their own rules. So in the beginning stage, if someone gets up and cusses someone out, of course I'm going to say something. Okay. But in the norming stage, forming stage, if they've been a group member, um, they really have, should have developed that cohesion. So when you see those questions, you want to make sure what stage of group it is. Okay. But thank you, Kara. Okay. So look at number two. A client in group therapy talks about a reoccurring fantasy involving sexual activity with his teenage daughter. He feels guilty about the thought and states he would never act on those fantasies. The worker would. What am I going to do? I got a one. I'm sorry. Did I, did I see somewhere in there where he had... Did I miss those words that he said he had abused his child? Because I don't recall seeing anything up there. And I remember, I got to believe the question, okay? I, I don't get to second guess the question. If that's what it says, I want to stick with the question, okay? <laughs> Hallie, if I went to, oh my Lord, if, if, if you call child support or police every time I was thinking something, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> okay. You do not. Before. Yes. You don't want to be in my head, baby, because you don't know what I'm thinking. So exactly. <laughs> but I don't know that. Don't, don't stay in the lines, stay in the lines. Okay. And, and a lot of time that's, that gets us in trouble, right? Because our social worker hat is like, ding, ding, ding. I know he's doing it. I know he's doing it. And he might be. But for the question, I can't prove that. So all I have to do is stick within the question, okay? So I'm sorry to tell you, I need you not to think, just to read. <laughs> just no thinking, just read. Okay, because you're right. My social worker hat's like, oh, what's going on here? But it's four. Four is the correct answer. Got it. Okay. Encourage the group to help him differentiate between responsibility for thoughts and actions and help him explore. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Yes, the group's going to help him. And, and again, I, I cannot, so, so that, and I thank you um, for saying that, um, Haley, because that's, that's what happens many times is because I'm a social worker, right? And I know he's going to touch her eventually if he hadn't already, but I can't, the, the question doesn't ask me that. I have to stay within the rules of the question. So thank you. That's exactly what it looks like. Okay. I'm going to skip down here. Okay. I mentioned before a little bit about Joseph Moreno and his psychodrama. So look at that, number eight. Which of the following is not associated with psychodrama? And again, this is one that you may never have seen, never have any idea, but I bet you can rule out things.
So psychodrama means you're getting up there and you're kind of acting out your life. And if you remember um, high school lit or college lit, you're, you're, you've got the protagonist and the agonist. And you're kind of what he'll ask you to do is get up here in front and role play your life. Oh, look it's at you, that. Craig. Yes. Formal scripts. Go ahead. Somebody said something. Oh, I was going to say it's three. You got it. It's my formal scripts. Because the goal of role playing is to get up there and act it out. So I'm not trying to script it. I'm just trying to let ha what happens happens, right? Good, good, good. Go back to this one. We see this one a lot. Number seven, in a group member diagnosed, in a group, in, in a group with members diagnosed with repressed schizophrenics, as regressed schizophrenics, a social worker would primary focus on the development of what? They are regressed schizophrenics. Okay, so what would she work on? Number one. Yeah, some structure. Um, so the problem with schizophrenia is that they're a little confused. They're a lot confused. They're not sure if the voices are coming from the people beside them or inside of their head, right? My hallucinations are my, I've got all five of my senses can experience hallucinations, right? So I can get some things crawling on me, some auditory. I can taste if someone poisoned my food. All of those things are, are um, symptoms. So we have positive and negative symptoms as well. So the positive things are things that I should not have. And the negative things are things that I should have. Okay. So the positive symptoms and negative symptoms are schizophrenia. Okay, so, um, you know, many times, and I'm not, please, don't, I'm not telling you to go out and touch a schizophrenic or hang out with one, but many times they're not as dangerous as people think they are because they're so disorganized. Okay, so we have positive symptoms, we have negative symptoms, and systems of disorganization. Okay, so what they don't have, okay, so positive things are things that they shouldn't have, but they do. Delusions, delusions are thoughts inside of my head. Okay, one second, Rhonda. Hallucinations, hallucinations are the things that I can touch, feel, or see. All five of my senses can hallucinate. Okay, disorganized speech because their thoughts are disorganized. That's where you get that um, tangential speech, that, you know, um, flight of ideas, magical thinking, things that they should have but they don't, or things that they, they don't have is, um, Things that they're missing, okay, negative. They have a flat affect. So they could be happy as everything, but the affect, the mood, flat, blunted, okay? Um, so reduced speech and loss of initiative, okay? So those are all of my things with schizophrenia. Pressured speech is when I talk like this and I can't get air in my mouth because I'm trying to get other words all at the same time and I'm trying to get out and I'm trying to take a breath and I'm trying to go, whoosh, whoosh. pressured speech, okay? So it's like my mind is jumbling. <laughs> it's just <laughs> my mind is jumbling and I'm trying to get all of those thoughts out. OK, <laughs> so <laughs> um, it's not rambling. It's the pressure. It is rambling is more of the loose ideas or, or tangential thoughts. Um, that's like, wow, today is Sunday. And you know what? Sunday is before Monday. And you know what? I like ice cream on Sundays. I had an ice cream Sunday one day last week. Oh, maybe I should get some chocolate ice cream when I'm out. Those are like tangential speech or loss of, of, uh, of free floating, things like that. But pressured speech is the pressure. Like I'm trying to get it all out in one breath. Okay. Yes. <gasps> Sometimes I'm my 16 year old. She's like, my mama can't tell you. And she'll like spew this like word salad out. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Back up. So, yes, it's pressure. It's pressure to get it all out. Okay. And many times that's, yeah, that's a sign of schizophrenia. Okay. Let me go back then. Let's see here. Look at six. A multi-service agency starts a program for drug addicted clients. The most likely a treatment approach would be. So, I'm looking at drug addicted clients.
Oh, you got it. That is two. That is two. What I know in general is uh, groups. The one thing we talked about earlier was universality and also kind of the confronting. So when we're working in a group, uh, group, especially with my drug users, um, you know, the theory is like, you know, drug users are a constant state of denial, right? So they are, they, they deny, they deny, they deny. You know, I've, I've had former users stand in front of me who've just gotten out of prison for, you know, 15 years. And I'll say, I could have stopped anytime I wanted to. So one of the things that works best is being, you know, in a group with other people who are like you to really, because, um, to call you on your stuff, to call you on your stuff, right? So that is the group therapy does work best. That's the premise of AA, of Celebrate Recovery, of most of those things is to have that, that treatment done. And again, also with my, my pedophiles, um, those people who um, haven't taken ownership for their behavior, group is the best place because someone's going to constantly call them on their stuff. And someone who, who's been there, who knows what it's like. Okay, good, good. How about 11? The first meeting of a group of adults who have never been in a treatment group, the worker would. It's their first time, first meeting, and they've never been in a group. I hear a one. Establish the agenda. A four, establish the agenda. I hear a one. What if I told you the answer is two? They've never been to treatment before. They've never been in a group. You've have your have you ever done treat group? You walk in and everybody's staring at everybody like, oh my gosh, somebody please say something. So the answer is two. I'm going to avoid asking questions and then I'm allow for the expression of questions and feelings. Okay. So hi, you know what? I'm Dr. Pam. I'm here. You know, we're going to run this group today. I imagine you're all being feeling very anxious. Um, you know, what kind of questions do you have? And that's even more important if you're doing a mandated group because they do not want to be there, do they? Okay, and it doesn't say it's a mandated, so I can't assume something. But the goal is that I'm going to restate the general principle of the group. But I really don't want to ask them any direct questions yet because it's week one and they don't trust the group yet. Um, allow them to engage with each other as this is the forming process. They're probably not going to do that either. Okay, it's, it's the forming process. They're probably all looking at me, waiting to see what happens. Okay, so, you know, I want to open the floor. I want to ask them if they want to ask questions. Okay, but they're probably just going to sit there. Um, I, I, I teach college, and I really kind of think about the first group as the first day of class. Okay, so remember your first day of class, and you didn't know anybody, and you're walking in, and you sit down, uh, and, and think of like the first day of class your freshman year, right? So you're sitting down and you're like, oh my gosh, these people look so smart. They must have everything I don't have. And um, like all those things you're worried about, right? Okay. So then what I'm going to do, usually on the first step of class as a teacher, I just kind of do some warm act activities, you know, because many of my students, and I know you overachievers, oh my God, you've got your assignment done the first day. I get the day before class, what's the syllabus? And can I do this? Can I do that? But not everybody's the same place. So the first day of class, I just want to make you feel comfortable. That's it. That's it. Okay. So all I'm going to do is chill. Let them enjoy the process. We'll get there. We'll get there, right? Now, if this were a task-oriented group, I'd come in and tell them exactly what the task is, right? A task-oriented group is many times leader-led, short and sweet. We're getting out of here and getting it done. Uh, let's look at number 14. A social worker leads a group of adults in a senior citizen center. During a group meeting, one client says she's going to kill herself and her husband. The threat appears to reflect real intent rather than being a, 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 an idea, ideation. The social worker would. What am I going to do? 
I got, yeah, I got a three. What else? You, that's a safety first. That's a safety first. You got it. Maintain the confidentiality. Nope. Okay. And the key in the question is the theme appears to be real. She believes it's true. Okay. So if it didn't say that, the first thing I might do is ask more information, but she believes it's real. So she can't maintain confidentiality. Why would she talk to her supervisor? Because she is the best social worker ever. Um, and speak to the center's consultants. What? That's that's a violation of HIPAA. I can't do that. He's in danger. I need to talk to. I need to warn him. So duty to warn means either the client or the police. And remember, when I'm looking at these choices, all I'm looking is at the the bat the best answer of the four choices they've given me. Okay. So that's so that's what makes three the best answer. Okay. Fifteen. All of the followings are, are examples of therapeutic gr or therapy groups, except I hate those not questions. I hate those except questions. So I try to figure out, well, three of these are right and one is not. So which one of these is not? Fifteen is three. You are got it. So. A group of people who have difficulty in uh, ridding themselves of the smoking habit, that'd be group. A first offender in juvenile detention center or probation, definitely. A discussion group for elderly married couples. Okay, well, that may be a group that is not a therapy group. And that was a key in that one. That was not a therapy group. Okay, and the question asked me, what is the example of therapy groups. So things like that are how we miss them, right? Gotta go back and always make sure. In general though, I'd rather you spend time on the question than flag it and come back. Because what happens is if you think this is too hard or I'm not sure um, and you come back, then you're going to um, many times, A, not have enough time to get them um, and, maybe reach, and maybe change your answers. So, and I do not want you to change your answers. I would rather you spend the time going over the question. If you have no earthly idea whatsoever, then flag and come back. But if you think you're right and you can prove it in the question, then go for it and don't come back and change it. You're, you're good at what you do. You know this stuff. Don't let the test get the better of you. Okay. Oh, look at that one. 20. In a group with a group of young adults, one member is a scapegoat. A major concern for the worker with scapegoating is, what is scapegoating? Number 20. Oh, got some brave people. Promotes possible retaliation from the members who are the target. No, my scapegoat, that's always, that's the family term also. It's one.
I did. Thank you. Sorry. I muted myself accidentally. Thanks. 29. A group of adolescent girls of Italian descent is planning a Christmas dance as part of their program at the neighborhood center. The neighborhood is changing and the center's programs are attracting a new group of newly arrived Latino adolescents who seem to be in competition with the older members. Hmm. The new members are likely to attend the dance. Some group members feel the event will um, degenerate into a hostile ethnic confrontation. One girl says it's going to get ugly. So a social worker working with the girls would first. What's she going to do first? It's about to get ugly up in here. What's she going to do? I got a two. I can tell you that number one will never, ever, ever be the right answer. We always have to do something. They would not put it on the test if I'm supposed to do nothing, right? Not, a, not an option. So one is out. Okay. That is correct. It is two. Okay. Somebody tell me why it's two. Anybody want to be brave? Exactly. <laughs> Somebody, why? I'll take a stab at it. Thanks. Then go ahead. Um, I think that it's two because um the first thing is the social worker is taking the concerns of what the client um quoted when it says it will get ugly. So she's mm -hmm. taking it seriously because she mm -hmm. doesn't know what that means. And because it's a group setting, the idea is to help the group help things go back into the group. So maybe help the group assess the issues within so that they can develop it amongst themselves while the social workers overseeing it. You got it. And it's so a first question. Good answer. Good. You get the bell. Yeah, yes. Okay. So the uh, a first question is like assess, right? And working with the girls, what should I do first? This is a safety concern, right? So my first is safety because it's going to get ugly up for her, right? So I need to ask right now, what does that mean? What does that mean? So exactly, I'm going to treat their concerns seriously. I want to gather more information. That's a full discussion. Help the group assess the issues and develop strategies. It's a group. It's a group. So let's kind of talk about it and process it as a group. Now, one of the assumptions, if they're able to process it, what stage of group might they be in? Emergence. Oh, that's a that's a uh, um oh wait, wrong one. Uh, yes, um, that's a community term, but you're oh, right, you're um, right. <laughs> what so, is it? Forming, storming, norm norming. norming. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they're they're probably perform performing, they're probably a fully working group, right? I think they're past forming. I think that they're pro if she's gonna have a discussion with them, and this is again you know, I think she may be past forming, right? It doesn't say how long it's been going on, does it? Uh, the new members. So they might be forming because, so what I bet, let's try this. They're probably in the, uh, they were in the performing stage. Then new people came in and you, the group can regress, can it not? So now they have to go back because new members have come in. So yeah, yeah. Okay, so you did mention those stages. Those are my group, uh, my community organization stages. So you're absolutely right that. So if it's a group, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to orientate. And then we're going to, you know, there's going to be some storming. Then they're going to emerge, means they come together with a group idea, and then they're going to then reinforce. So, yes, right on those group stages. I'm sorry, those community action stages. Okay. Last one, guys. Look at number 30. The importance of the code of ethics is... One. Okay, it is one. It is one on this question. But if you see a question and it says anything about the client, that's the right answer. The client always comes first. Why did you get up this morning and get dressed? Because of my client. Why did you come to group today? Because of my client. So just know that 
client always comes first, according to the code of ethics. It is even that um, before my job, my client comes first. So all of those things have to do with just my client. So that's the best answer for that one. But if you see it any place else, remember it is about the client. Okay.